like to welcome up Friesen Doherty. Friesen, come on up here. You came to our fellowship family with your lovely wife and your growing son, what, a couple of years ago? That's correct. And you have been an active and enthusiastic member of this family. And we welcome you today and look forward to what you have to share. Well, thank you. Now, uh, I won't keep you long. Or I feel that if uh, one really has something to say, they can say it without being long-winded. So I'll try not to be long-winded to emphasize that this, in fact, is worth saying. <laughs> so the subject of my talk today is uh, two things that, well, me being a, a member of the fellowship, I quite frankly wanted to get away from. Uh, and that is religion and sin. I mean, personally, if some guy came up here and had the audacity to talk about sin in this place, I'd be like, oh, red alert, shields up. He's going to be putting me in some box. Sin's not a real thing anyway. And religion cannot be defined. It's free flowing. It's love. And it's, well, actually, it can be defined. <laughs> and hopefully, after this definition, you will find it, this, uh, this message entertaining and edifying. That's if I do it correctly. <laughs> so be patient with me. So it, it is truly a pleasure and an honor to speak with you today and share this message. And I'm, my intention is to put a new school approach on what is relatively old school by giving you the oldest of school of viewpoints on them. So this story starts with a uh, conversation that my father was having with a certain Archbishop Stallings. He is an Archbishop of the Catholic Church and he is a very educated man and quite distinguished in, in many ways and he was telling my father, he said, Reverend Darty, by chance do you know what the original definition of religion is? I said, no, do tell, do tell, that, that sounds quite interesting. Religion is actually a Latin word. Re, uh, meaning again in legio, which means to bind, to connect. So from that perspective, religion quite literally means reconnect. Now, from that perspective, it seems that from the beginning of civilization, human beings just have a natural predilection to want to form religions because we come into this place with a, a kind of a burning feeling of like, there's just something missing here. There's something missing. I mean, I got my cornfields, I have my cows, and, and I have, you know, my everything else, and it's just something's not quite right. You know, this is like ancient Babylonia. Now we have cell phones and iPads and, and you know, computers and cars, and still we get, oh, well, you know, this is not what I came here for. I came here to connect to something. So what is that? Well, some people might say, well, to reconnect to Mm, I don't know, uh, a deeper sense of aliveness or to connect to maybe a really uh, fascinating television show or a tub of Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> but uh, I, I would say that the, the thing that we desire to reconnect to most is life itself. Now, I'm going to have to make up a word because I was looking for a definition on the opposite of religion, and I guess anti-religion could be it, but that's a little heavy-handed for the definition that I would like to put on it. So I, I play with this word called disligion, and uh, <laughs> disligion is the, uh, the practice which is the opposite of religion. So if religion is to reconnect, disligion would be something that allows us to disconnect. Now the symptoms of practicing decision is one tends to have a sense of loneliness. 
isolation, frustration, people tend to be quite bothersome indeed. And it's in some very extreme cases of practitioners of disillusion, they end up in the newspapers along with Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy. So this definitely one should not go out of their way to make disillusion a natural reoccurring practice of their daily routine and try to find practices that are centered on religious practices. So from that definition, what is a religious practice? A religious practice, from, from my perspective, would be something that helps us to reconnect. Reconnect to what specifically? Well, life and how we relate to life. Relationships. Any true religion worth its salt has practices in it that support relationships. And one of the most important relationships that are really the foundation of most of all relationships are our relationships to our emotions. Now, I don't know if anybody else has experienced this, but I find myself uh, encountering a lot of very hyper-energetic people that just don't want to feel negative emotions. Be happy, don't feel sad, just don't you know, cheer up, da -da 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 -da, all things along this nature. But the unfortunate thing about that kind of practice is we're missing out on a very important part of relating to our emotions. Negative emotions are actually the path out of the endless cycle of suffering or, as I would like to say a little, a little more lightly, the, uh, the merry-go-round of suffering, so it's not so hmm, uh, <laughs> foreboding. So, what is the merry-go-round of suffering? Well, to put it simply, it consists of these four things, and there's a fifth part missing, and that is denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then bouncing back to denial, anger, bargaining, depression, essentially the five stages of grief, the last part being acceptance. And without acceptance, we can't ever hope to escape this endless cycle. It just goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Now, the big grievances in life, the loss of a loved one, the departure of a dear pet, a life's work or career suddenly ended or ruined, these are events that just simply cannot be ignored and will be acknowledged and will be accepted eventually. So these are really not, as big as they are, as colossal as they are, these are not the things that have the potential to rob us of our sense of aliveness. It's the small grievances that have the potential to eat us alive, like piranha. <laughs> I mean, a piranha is just a little fish about so big, it's not a shark. But give, it, give maybe a couple thousand of those things and they can polish off a cow in under a minute. <laughs> this is what it's like when we try and walk around with all these little grievances that we didn't let go of yet. Like uh, the fact that the toast fell down on the floor, butter side down. The, the person cutting you off in traffic when they just weren't paying attention. The friend who said something quite unfriendly. These are the small grievances that have the opportunity to keep us on that merry-go-round of suffering indefinitely. And by us not relating to our emotions and not practicing acceptance, we will stay on that cycle of suffering potentially for the rest of our lives. And this is a really serious problem. Uh, <laughs> I am quite embarrassed to share this example of how I went through the uh, merry-go-round of suffering. It actually happened yesterday. And I was thinking, wow, anybody who thought God did not have a sense of humor has well, they just haven't really had this opportunity to just make sure that there's no doubt that God is quite the jokester. Because I'm sure he was saying, well, free son, you have put together this very nice sermon tomorrow, but let's make sure you have a fresh example for everybody today. How does that sound? So I was on my way, and I was actually running a little late to go to a meeting 
for uh, minimalism, actually hosted by my life coach. And I was like, well, this is great. I'm going to get there on time. I'm going to be about five minutes late. And was anybody on the highway from Rosemont to Independence around, let's say, oh, 115? And he, yeah, were you there? Was, yeah. Was, yeah. Uh, oh, so you, uh, so you waved to me. You're like, hey, so glad I'm not you. I hope things turn out for you better. <laughs> I found myself in the worst traffic jam of my life. I kid you not. This was not slow. It was not like creeping. I was sitting on the highway, car turned off, e-brake on, waiting. It was a parking lot. People are walking around on the highway, you know, brandishing their fists at the air. Why me? Oh, Lord, why me? It was, I didn't know what it was. It could have been, it could have been maybe an airplane crashed on the highway. It could have been, I don't know, maybe that there was a, a sale at Best Buy and all iPhones were a dollar. It could have been the zombie apocalypse. I had no idea what it was, but here I was stuck on the highway already late. And I was like, wow, there's like no end to this. It was so bad, cars were actually trying to exit the highway, going the opposite direction on the exit ramps, going up against the flow of traffic. It was that serious. The emergency vehicles could not get through because it was just so packed. So I'm sitting here on the merry-go-round suffering, thinking like, oh, this is terrible. Why is this happening to me right now? If I only did not take that exit, I'd be fine, denial. Anger, oh, this is so unfair. I mean, my app, my app is supposed to tell me where the traffic is and it didn't tell me. And then bargaining, well, maybe it's gonna clear up. Maybe I'll be a little late. It's not gonna be so bad. And then depression, oh, it's really that bad. It's not gonna clear up. I'm gonna be stuck here till like midnight. And, and then going back to anger, this is so unfair. And then I was thinking, okay, I see what's happening here. <laughs> let's, let's just hit the pause button and let's just entertain the fact that I'm really gonna be here for probably four or five hours. And that's okay because I'm safe. I'm sitting inside my car. It has plenty of gas. I can turn on the air conditioner. I can turn on the radio. I can talk to a friend. My phone is fully charged. I can play Angry Birds. This is going to be awesome. I have an uninterrupted vacation here on the highway. This is great. And as soon as I was really getting it, it's like, yeah, this is awesome. What happens? The traffic starts moving. Well, that's just fantastic, isn't it? <laughs> but, you know, that's... That's the endless cycle of suffering. Without acceptance, there's no way to get out of it. And it just keeps going on and on and on and on and on. So, but as far as on that way, I digress. I think I illustrated that quite clearly. Now sin, who here wants to hear about sin? Oh, ooh, yes, we have a couple of takers. Great, great, that's, that's all I need, just a couple. All right, <clears throat> so sin, uh, as a kid, I had the impression of what sin was. Sin, it's a crime against heaven and God. You must pay this back. And if you have too much sin, like you're collecting debt, well, the creditors will come and say, well, you're just gonna have to stay here in purgatory and hell until you pay this off, or just burn in hell indefinitely, because we can't have somebody coming into heaven with this much sin. I'm sorry, you just, you're barred from entry. And I was like, oh my goodness, I really have to make sure I don't sin, because you know, bad things might happen to me. And then as I got older, that didn't really make so much sense anymore until my mother said, hey, free son, did I ever share with you the original translation of what sin means? I was like, the original translation? Wait, there's another meaning behind it? Of course. Sin means to miss the mark. I was like, to miss the mark? Fascinating. Missing the mark doesn't really have any kind of um, meanings of judgment or impending doom attached to that at all. That sounds more like a misunderstanding. So then, when I was looking at that from that perspective, I was like, wow, that makes so much sense to miss the mark. So let me look over the seven deadly sins and see if that seems a little more sensible. So yeah, pride. It's quite good to love yourself. 
you know? But if you love yourself to the point where it compromises your ability to relate with others, you've missed the mark. Greed or envy. No, envy. It's, you know, it actually can be a positive thing to look at what others have achieved or what they have and have that inspire just enough uh, dissatisfaction in you to have you go and achieve something great as well. Greed, to have a love for the things in your life and to appreciate what you, the things you have can be good. But when it comes to the point where it compromises your ability to relate, you miss the mark. Sloth, yeah, it's great to take a break, but if you, that's all you do, you've missed the mark. <laughs> and, uh, wrath, aggression can be a good thing. It can help you in athletic endeavors and it can save your life in a dangerous situation. But if wrath is projected towards an individual for self-righteous means, you miss the mark. Lust, physical interaction can be an amazing spiritual experience. However, if your desire for physical interaction compromises your ability to relate, You've missed the mark. And I can go on and on on this. And I see that it's actually quite coherent and it has quite a, a very different meaning behind it. To miss the mark or to miss the point. This is a misunderstanding. So imagine what somebody's life would be like if every time they tried to hit the mark, their, their life is just full of all these missed marks. And there's no judgment there. They, they're just a person who has created a life and they've become the architect of their own misery from being so disconnected and so confused to what this natural interaction of life originally had to offer us to support relationships as opposed to just supporting ourselves and having others be the greatest good for us, not what we can be for them, but what they can be for us. It's missing the mark. So, we're almost done. <laughs> so, with that said, based on this definition of sin and religion, I think this might have lined up what we originally might have thought or considered about when people say sin and religion. Because these are very, very old school definitions of sin and religion. And notice how if people had a clear understanding of these de definitions, we might not find ourselves in the same level of, of religious discord and lack of peace in this global climate. Isn't that fascinating? And I'd like to share with you an analogy that my brother and I came up with when we were having a philosophical discussion. And it came about something like this. He said, wow, that's a very interesting definition that you were talking about as far as religion, that it's a practice and not a philosophy per se. So what he said is that religion sounds like an organized religion, sounds a lot more like the name of your band. And the religious practice that you observe is the music you make. And isn't that fascinating how so many people get so caught up in, well, this is our band name, and this is where my band is going on tour, this is the lead singer of the band, I'm the drummer, that's the bass player, and you just keep going on about all these meaningless points about the band. And it's like, well, what kind of music do you play? Well, I'm kind of out of practice, and you know, we're just, we're kind of going through a phase right now with a little, da, da, da. it's like, but the music is the most important part, right? I mean, you don't have to know the name of the band in order to say, wow, that's a really nice song. I like this music, right? And notice how you don't have to be a part of the band in order to be a musician. You just have to make music. Isn't that fantastic? And when somebody comes to you and say, are you religious? You can say, yes, I am religious. What religion are you part of? No, 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 you can say, I'm religious. Well, what religion? What's your band? I don't have a band. I'm a musician. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> Would you like to hear some music? How about a hug? <laughs> and it's, it's just, it, it's such a wonderful world we live in when we take a little time to look at the, the origin of things. Because having a sense of the direction is not knowing where you're going but knowing where you came from, so you're not doubling back. And before I close, I'd like to share 
some of the religious practices that I observe. And they're quite simple. One religious practice that I love observing is taking time to just feel negative emotions. Because positive emotions are easy to feel. I love feeling those all day. But the negative emotions, they take a little more time. They take a little more nurturing. And if I can just feel it without asking why it's there, it is eventually replaced with the softest, gentlest sensations of peace. Another religious practice that I like to observe is when I eat or drink something, I really savor it. I'm really there with it. And I just feel so alive in that moment because that's what all the great religious teachers tried to show us through prayer, through meditation, is to culture an environment in your life where focus becomes the base of your operation and not distraction. I mean, if there was, and I don't know if there is, a group or an organization that is out to try and um, snuff out the spiritual spark of the world, they would be accused of using WMDs on us, weapons of mass distraction. Because <laughs> everything in the media is, look over here, look over there, look at this, look at that, buy this, do this, go there. Distraction, distraction, distraction. And distraction is, by its very definition, disreligion. Because you cannot focus when you're distracted. But in the presence of focus, all kinds of amazing, profound spiritual things become possible. Intimacy, self-reflection, deep understanding. So really, to define what is a religious practice is really anything that encourages focus, encourages intimacy, self-reflection, and in improves your ability to relate. That is the definition of religion as far as I can see it. So with that said, I say to you, go forth and make beautiful music. Thank you. <laughs>